Good afternoon. Thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Sandy Savestine. My infection prevention and control colleague, Kirsten Simpkins, and I will present the topic, Safe Injection Practices and Assisted Monitoring of Blood Glucose in Long-Term Care Facilities, on behalf of the Virginia Department of Health's Healthcare Associated Infections and Antimicrobial Resistance Team. This educational presentation is pre-recorded and slides will be made available after the webinar. Time has been set aside for questions and discussion at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to add them to the chat and they will be addressed. Thank you. Let's get started. As presenters today, we have nothing to disclose. The goal of today's webinar is to describe and discuss outbreaks related to unsafe injection and infusion practices, describe and discuss outbreaks related to unsafe use of diabetes blood sugar monitoring equipment, identify infection prevention and control best practice recommendations for safe injection and assisted blood glucose monitoring, and identify resources to aid in assuring safe injection practices and assisted monitoring of blood glucose. <clears throat> The knowledge of continued outbreaks of viral hepatitis and concerns for safety in our long-term care facilities with regard to injection practices and assisted monitoring of blood glucose underscores the need for today's webinar. I will now turn it over to Kirsten who will provide information with regard to injection practices. Thank you, Kirsten. What is injection safety or safe injection practices? Injection safety is a set of measures taken to perform injections in an optimally safe manner for patients, healthcare personnel, and others. It is part of standard precautions as referred to in the CDC 2007 guideline for isolation precautions. A safe injection never harms the recipient, does not expose the provider to avoidable risks and does not result in any waste that is dangerous to other people. Standard precautions include a group of infection prevention practices that apply to all patients regardless of suspected or confirmed infection status in any setting in which healthcare is delivered. These include hand hygiene, use of gloves, gown, mask, eye protection, or face shield, depending on the anticipated exposure and safe injection practices. What are unsafe injection practices? Unsafe injection practices put patients and healthcare providers at risk of infectious and non-infectious adverse events and have been associated with a wide variety of procedures and settings. Unsafe injection practices that have resulted in disease transmission include using the same syringe to administer medication to more than one patient, Accessing a medication vial or bag with a syringe that has already been used to administer medication to a patient, then using the remaining contents from that vial or bag for another patient. Using medications packaged as a single dose or single use for more than one patient. Failing to use aseptic technique when, when preparing and administering injections. What is the impact of unsafe injection practices? The World Health Organization estimated that in 2000, overuse and unsafe use of healthcare injections caused 30% of new infections with hepatitis B virus, 41% of new infections with hepatitis C, and 9% of new infections with HIV. In the U.S., syringe reuse and misuse of medication vials have resulted in dozens of outbreaks and the need to alert more than 150,000 patients. From 2008 to 2019, 66 outbreaks of healthcare-associated viral hepatitis in the U.S. Were, were reported to the CDC. Outbreaks of hepatitis C virus have occurred because of infection control breaches, unsafe injection practices, and unsafe practices related to assisted glucose, blood glucose monitoring. Here are some examples of infectious disease outbreaks that have resulted from unsafe injection practices. Breaches in safe injection practices can cause irre irreparable damage, exposing patients to bloodborne illnesses such as hepatitis and HIV and to life-threatening bacterial infections such as MRSA. Outbreaks occur in a variety of settings such as hospitals, long-term care, primary care clinics, and dental clinics. We will discuss some of these examples over the next few slides. 
In this first example, on January 2, 2008, the Nevada State Health Division contacted CDC regarding two persons recently diagnosed with acute hepatitis C. A total of six cases were identified during the initial investigation. Initial inquiries found that all three persons with acute hepatitis C underwent procedures at the same endoscopy clinic within 35 to 90 days of illness onset. Investigation revealed that hepatitis C virus transmission likely resulted from reuse of syringes on individual patients and use of single-use medication vials on multiple patients at the clinic. Approximately 40,000 patients of the clinic were notified. This is an illustration of an unsafe injection practice identified at the endoscopy clinic. Inappropriate reuse of syringes on individual persons and use of medication vials intended for single person use on multiple persons was identified through direct observation of infection control practices. Specifically, a clean needle and syringe were used to draw medication from a single use vial of propofol. The medication was injected directly through an IV catheter into the patient's arm. If a patient required more sedation, the needle was removed from the syringe and replaced with a new needle. The new needle was the old, with the old syringe was used to draw more medication. Backflow from the patient's intravenous catheter or from needle removal might have contaminated the syringe with hepatitis C and subsequently contaminated the vial. Medication remaining in the vial was used to sedate the next patient. This outbreak highlights the importance of surveillance and investigation in detecting viral hepatitis transmission in healthcare settings and adherence to recommended, recommended infection control practices. In this next example, there was an outbreak of Sucumurella species bloodstream infection among patients at an oncology clinic in West Virginia during the time period of 2011 to 2012. 15 cases of Sucumurella bloodstream infections were in identified, all in patients with underlying malignancy and indwelling central lines. The species are gram-positive bacilli that have been isolated in the environment from soil and sludge and are uncommonly reported to cause human disease. The only significant risk factor for infection was receipt of saline flush from the clinic during the period September to October of 2011 when the clinic had been preparing saline flush from a common source bag of saline. Saline bags are not labeled as FDA approved multi multiple dose containers. Assessments of infection control and medication preparation practices during the October 2011 site visit noted that rather than using prepackaged commercially manufactured saline flush syringes, clinic staff pre-drew 10 milliliter saline flush syringes at the beginning of each day from a new 250 milliliter bag of normal saline within the chemotherapy hood. Although multiple infection control lapses were identified, the outbreak was likely caused by improper preparation of saline flush syringes by the clinic. The outbreak demonstrates that bloodstream infections can result from improper infection control practices and highlights the critical need for increased attention to and oversight of infection control. Here are some other examples of viral hepatitis outbreaks that have occurred due to breaches in infection control related to injection safety practices. Modes of transmission include reuse of syringes to access multiple dose vials, multiple dose vials accessed in the immediate patient treatment area, use of single dose vials for greater than one patient, and lack of disinfection of medication vials in the medication preparation area. There are steps that every provider should take to prevent outbreaks of infections from unsafe injection practices. Use a new sterile syringe and needle for each person, even if the needle is changed or you're injecting through an intervening length of IV tubing. It is important to use one needle and one syringe only one time when administering an injections to prevent the spread of microorganisms, especially bloodborne pathogens. A small amount of blood can flow into the needle and syringe even when only positive pressure is applied outward. 
the syringe and needle are both contaminated and must be discarded. There have been multiple outbreaks resulting from healthcare per personnel re reusing syringes to access medications for a single patient and then using contents from that vial or bag for subsequent patients. Always use aseptic technique when, when preparing and administering injections. Always use a new sterile needle and new sterile syringe to enter a vial, single dose or multiple dose vials, bottle, or an IV bag. Never use medications packaged as single dose or single use for more than one patient. Ensure appropriate sharps disposal immediately after injection. Appropriate sharps disposal prevents needle stick injuries and the spread of infections. According to CDC guidelines, the use of aseptic technique when, when preparing and administering IV push medications flush locking solutions or other parent, parenteral solutions administered by direct IV injection is necessary to avoid contamination of sterile injection equipment. Aseptic technique includes hand hygiene prior to and after preparation and administration of the medication or solution. If gloves are used, hand hygiene must be performed immediately before and after glove use. Hand hygiene is an essential component of aseptic technique. Disinfection of the medication access diaphragm on a vial or the neck of an ampule prior to accessing the medication or solution. Disinfection of the IV access port, needleless connector, other vascular access device. The use of PPE if contact and exposure to blood or bodily fluids are possible. Clean your hands with an alcohol-based hand rubber soap and water before preparing medication and touching the patient. Follow the World Health Organization's five moments for hand hygiene, which are one, before touching a patient, two, before clean aseptic pr procedure, three, after blood body fluid exposure risk, four, after touching a patient, and five, after touching patient surroundings. Be sure to practice proper hand hygiene before preparing and giving an injection, which is moment two, and after the injection has been administered, moment three. When hand hygiene is performed at the right moment, it keeps the patient, other healthcare workers, and yourself safe. For medication preparation, never store needles and syringes unwrapped. Needles and syringes should be stored in their sterile wrapper to prevent contamination. Remove the needle cannula syringe from its sterile packaging immediately before use. Draw up medication into a syringe as close to administration time as possible. It should not be drawn too, up too far in advance as exposing the unwrapped needle syringes to the environment may expose the injecting equipment to microorganisms such as bacteria, viruses, and fungus. Disinfect the rubber septum of medication vials and the neck of glass ampules with 70% alcohol, allowing an adequate time to dry before entry. According to the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epi Epidemiology, APIC, practitioners should disinfect vials by clen cleansing the access diaphragm using friction and a sterile 70% isopropyl alcohol ethyl alcohol, iodophore, or other approved antiseptic swab. Organizational standards for infection control in each facility should identify which disinfectant to use. It is important to wait at least 10 seconds to allow the diaphragm to dry before in inserting any device into the vial or accessing the medication. Practitioners may not be aware that the pop-off vial caps from the manufacturers are considered dust covers and are not intended to maintain sterility of the vial di diaphragm or access point. Thus, the diaphragm must always be disinfected after removing the cap of a new vial. Check manufacturer's label and expiration date. Medications should be drawn up in a designated clean medication preparation area that is not adjacent to potential sources of contamination, including sinks or other water sources. Water can splash or spread as droplets. Therefore, it is important to ensure that the medication preparation area is greater than three feet from the sink. 
The medication preparation area should be cleaned and disinfected on a regular basis and any time there is evidence of soiling to reduce potential cont contamination. To ensure that injection equipment is not contaminated, it is important to keep the medication preparation area, area clean. This re means removing clutter from all surfaces so that they may be adequately disinfected prior to gathering the necessary injection equipment. Practice aseptic technique. Medication may become con contaminated, which can lead to the patient resident becoming ill. Microorganisms may be spread from the unclean area to the patient resident or equipment via cross-contamination. Preparing medications in a clean space reduces the likelihood of contaminating the medication, injection needles, and syringes, and therefore lowers the risk of causing a healthcare-associated infection. Never store needles, cannulas, syringes unwrapped, removed from sterile packaging immediately before use. There should be ready access to necessary supplies such as alcohol-based hand rub, needles and syringes in their sterile packaging, and alcohol wipes in the medication prep area to ensure that staff can adhere to aseptic technique. It is important for the provider to always check the label of a medication vial to see if it is single dose or multiple dose. The size of the vial does not distinguish, distinguish its designation of single or multiple dose. Single dose vials are meant to be accessed for one patient resident only for one injection case procedure, then discarded after use. Single dose vials do not contain antimicrobial preservative. Accessing the rubber stop of a single dose vial more than one time increases the likelihood of contaminating the medication. If there is medication left over in a single dose vial, it must be thrown away and not saved for future use. There have been outbreaks resulting from pooling of contents of single dose or single use vials and of, or storage of contents for future use. A multi-dose vial is a vial of liquid medication intended for parenteral administration, injection, or infusion that contains more, more than one dose of medication. Multi-dose vials are labeled as such by the manufacturer and typically contain an antimicrobial preservative to help prevent the growth of bacteria. The preser preservative has no effect on viruses and does not protect against contamination when healthcare personnel fail to follow safe injection practices. Multiple dose vials must be discarded or dedicated as single patient resident use only if they enter the immediate patient resident care area. This is to prevent inadvertent contamination of the vial through direct or indirect contact with potentially contaminated surfaces or equipment that could then lead to infections in subsequent patients. Discard multi-dose vials when the beyond use date has been reached. In other words, if a multiple dose vial has been opened or accessed, for example, needle punctured, the vial should be dated and discarded within 28 days unless the manufacturer specifies a different date for that open vial, whether that be shorter or longer. If a multiple dose vial has not been opened or accessed, for example, needle punctured, it should be discarded according to the manufacturer's expiration date. If sterility is questioned or compromised, the multiple dose vial should be discarded regardless of the date. Single dose vials and multiple dose vials can come in any shape and size. Do not assume that a vial is a single dose vial or multiple dose vial based on size, or volume of edge medication. Always check the label. Remember to use one needle, one syringe, only one time. This is highlighted, highlighted by the One Health, One and Only campaign, which is a public health campaign to raise awareness among patients and healthcare providers about safe injection practices. The campaign is led by the C CDC and the Safe Injection Practices Coalition. Injection safety is every provider's responsibility. Blood glucose testing provides an underappreciated opportunity for exposure to bloodborne viruses through contaminated equipment and supplies when shared. Outbreaks of viral hepatitis infections associated with blood glucose monitoring have been identified with increasing regularity, particularly in long-term care settings where residents often require assistance with monitoring of blood glucose levels and or insulin administration. 
The risk of transmission and infection is present in any setting where blood glucose monitoring equipment is shared or when those assisting with blood glucose monitoring and or insulin administration fail to follow basic principles of infection control. Of 66 outbreaks reported to the CDC between 2008 and 2019, 19 occurred in long-term care facilities. It's important to note that 15 out of the 19, or 79% of these outbreaks, have been associated with infection control breaks during assisted monitoring of blood glucose. Outbreaks of hepatitis C virus have also occurred as a result of unsafe practices related to assisted blood glucose monitoring. These outbreaks of viral hepatitis have resulted in hundreds of cases of viral hepatitis and thousands of people notified and screened for bloodborne pathogens. There are more than 34 million people in the United States today with diabetes. That is one in every 10 people, many who require assistance with monitoring their blood glucose levels. These folks are at an increased risk of acquiring healthcare associated bloodborne pathogens. Self monitoring is when an individual is capable of performing all the steps of testing and insulin administration themselves. They are able to maintain and use their own equipment. Assisted monitoring of blood glucose is when another person assists with or performs testing and insulin administration for an individual. Assisted monitoring of blood glucose can occur in hospitals, clinics, long-term care facilities, senior centers, health fairs, correctional facilities, and schools or camps. Activities that allow for the transmission of bloodborne pathogens, such as viral hepatitis, to unsuspecting residents, patients, and healthcare personnel during assisted blood glucose monitoring include using pinlet style spring loaded finger stick devices intended for single person use on multiple individuals, sharing of blood glucose testing meters without proper cleaning and disinfection with appropriate disinfectant between uses, using insulin pins for more than one person and the failure to change gloves and perform hand hygiene between finger stick procedures. We will now look at finger stick devices, blood glucose meters, and insulin pins, how their unsafe use can lead to transmission of bloodborne pathogens and outbreaks, and offer recommendations for best practices for each. There are two types of finger stick devices. As you know, finger stick devices or lancing devices are used to prick the skin to obtain drops of blood for testing. There are reusable devices, which are pin-like and are designed for reuse on a single person. They should never be used on more than one person, and they are intended to be used by individual persons for self-monitoring of blood glucose. And then there are single-use devices. These are auto-disabling finger stick devices that permanently retract upon use. They are disposable, which prevents reuse through an auto-disabling feature. They're single use only and should be used in settings where assisted monitoring of blood glucose is performed. Reusable finger stick devices become contaminated with blood on the inner and outer surfaces and wiping them does not remove all of the blood. This is why it's so important these be used for individuals for self-monitoring and should never be shared or used on more than one person. You may ask, is it okay to use a finger stick device for multiple residents as long as the lancet and disposable components are changed and the device is cleaned and disinfected after each use? And the answer is no. Due to failures to change the disposable components, difficulties with cleaning and disinfection of reusable components after every use, and their link to multiple hepatitis B virus outbreaks, the CDC and FDA recommend that these devices never be used for more than one person. The use of finger stick devices for more than one resident and failure to use gloves and perform hand hygiene between finger stick procedures has been cited as having occurred for multiple outbreaks. It is not okay to use finger stick devices that are equipped with cartridges of multiple preloaded lancets for multiple patients. Even if the device is advanced and a new lancet is used for each finger stick procedure, unused lancets can become contaminated through contact with blood remaining on the end cap or the device barrel. Even when a reusable finger stick device is dedicated for single patient use, it's not okay for a healthcare worker to use when providing assistance with blood glucose monitoring. 
In settings where assisted blood glucose monitoring is performed, CDC recommends single-use auto-disabling finger stick devices to prevent the inadvertent reuse for more than one person. It is acceptable, though, for a resident in a long-term care facility to use a reusable finger stick device, provided they are able to perform their own self-blood glucose monitoring. Recommended practices for finger stick devices include finger stick devices should never be used for more than one person. Reusable lancing devices are not recommended for healthcare settings as they are never to be used for more than one person. Restrict use of reusable finger stick devices to individual persons who can perform self-monitoring of blood glucose. Auto-disabling single-use finger stick lancets should be used for assisted monitoring of blood glucose. Never reuse lancets. Dispose of used lancets immediately at the point of use in an approved sharps container. And always change gloves and perform hand hygiene between finger stick procedures. We will now talk about the blood glucose meter or glucometer, which as you may know is a portable device used to measure the level of glucose in the blood. There are many brands on the market. They are typically assigned to individuals for self-monitoring of their blood glucose. The risks of transmission of bloodborne pathogens from glucometers include sharing of the glucometer to perform assisted monitoring of blood glucose on multiple people without proper cleaning and disinfection of the device between each use. There can be microscopic amounts of blood on the device that may contain infectious viral particles that can serve as a reservoir for inoculation into the next resident's finger stick wound. Cross-contamination of clean supplies with contaminated glucose monitoring equipment is a risk for transmission as well. This is one reason it's important to separate clean items from potentially contaminated or used items, to not carry items in pockets, and to perform blood glucose monitoring in a clean prepped area. Another means of transmission is not removing gloves and performing hand hygiene after assisting with blood glucose monitoring. The gloved hands of healthcare personnel can become contaminated with blood at various points, including pricking the patient's finger or handling the test strip. With this, blood can be transferred to the meter when healthcare personnel handle the meter to obtain the reading. Other practices that can lead to the transmission of viral hepatitis include disinfecting the glucometer between uses but not doing it properly by not following the manufacturer's instructions for cleaning and disinfection with the appropriate disinfectant for the particular device and for the designated amount of time or contact dwell time determined to be effective. You may think that if the blood glucose meter never touches the resident during the procedure that contamination could not occur. However, infectious agents can be transmitted from one patient or resident to another or from the healthcare worker assisting with blood glucose monitoring through indirect contact, even when blood is not visible. Due to the close patient contact with the meter, as during preloading of the test strip and from the hands of healthcare personnel that can become contaminated while assisting with blood glucose monitoring, such as during the finger stick or handling of the test strip. If shared, the blood glucose meter must be cleaned and disinfected appropriately. Recommended practices for blood glucose meters include the following. Appropriately labeled blood glucose meters should be assigned to individual persons and not shared. Blood glucose meters dedicated for single resident use should be stored in a manner that will protect against inadvertent use of the device for additional residents and also against cross-contamination via contact with other glucometers or equipment, preferably in a clean location in the resident's room when possible. If blood glucose meters must be shared or when healthcare workers provide assisted blood glucose monitoring, the device should be cleaned and disinfected after every use per the manufacturer's instructions using the appropriate disinfectant for the correct contact time to prevent carryover of blood infectious agents. If the manufacturer doesn't specify how the device should be cleaned and disinfected, then it should not be shared. It is important to consult the manufacturer's instructions for use when acquiring a new device or when training a new person who will be responsible for assisting residents with blood glucose monitoring. The disinfectant should be effective against HIV, hepatitis C, and hepatitis B viruses. And note that 70% ethanol solutions are not effective against viral bloodborne pathogens. 
and the use of 10% bleach solutions may lead to physical degradation or breakdown of the device. A list of Environmental Protection Agency registered disinfectants can be found on the EPA site. It is very important to use the disinfectant recommended so that cleaning and disinfection is effective and so that it won't react with the device materials and damage the device, which may cause erroneous results from the device. Wear gloves during blood glucose monitoring and change and perform hand hygiene between patient or resident contacts when gloves are potentially contaminated and before touching other medical supplies intended for use on other residents. We'll turn our attention now to insulin pins. An insulin pin is a pin-shaped injector device that contains a reservoir for insulin or has an insulin cartridge with multiple doses. It provides an alternative to a vial and syringe for injecting diabetes medicines. Insulin pins are designed to be used multiple times for a single person using a new needle for each injection. They are intended for self-injection and hence a single person use device. Remember, one pin, one person. Transmission risks associated with insulin pins include reusing or sharing of insulin pins or other injection equipment for more than one person, changing the needle and reusing the cartridge of an insulin pin on another person, which is equivalent to syringe reuse. It is not okay to use the device for multiple residents. During use, blood can be regurgitated into the insulin cartridge after injection. Changing the cartridge does not protect against contamination and does not make these devices safe for use on more than one person. Another transmission risk associated with insulin pins is the accidental use of an insulin pin on an unintended person or resident, which can result in notifications and screening testing for bloodborne pathogens once the error has been identified. Failure to clearly label insulin pins with the resident's name or other identifying information to ensure the correct pin is used only on the correct person is another risk to transmission. And also the failure to properly store a resident's insulin pin in a manner that prevents the inadvertent use with other residents and that prevents cross-contamination, which could occur if stored with other resident pins or temporarily in a pocket. Factors that can contribute to the use of insulin pins for more than one person include inconsistencies in or insufficient training on the proper use of the device, confusion regarding the difference between multi-dose vials and multi-dose insulin pins, which are intended for multiple doses for one person, time constraints, the healthcare worker could be in a hurry with multiple residents, missing medications, and the lack of appropriate warning labels. The recommended practices with regard to insulin pins include each pin is designed to be safe for just one resident or patient to use multiple times with a new, fresh needle after each injection. Each individual should be assigned their own insulin pin to prevent cross-contamination. Insulin pins should be clearly labeled with the patient or resident's name or other identifying information and stored in a clean location, preferably in the patient's room. Wear gloves during blood glucose monitoring, administration of insulin, and during any other procedure that involves potential exposure to blood or body fluids. Hand hygiene should be performed immediately after removal of gloves. Review policies and procedures and educate staff regarding safe use of insulin pins and report medication errors or adverse events involving diabetes drugs. Other more general recommendations that are important to consider for injection safety and assisted monitoring of blood glucose include use of a clean field or clean area on a med cart to contain equipment. Supplies should not be placed on the bedside table or soft bedding and keep unused or clean supplies separate from used supplies. Supplies and medications should not be carried in pockets. Unused supplies taken to a resident's bedside during finger stick monitoring or insulin administration should not be used for another patient. Outbreaks due to failure to follow safe injection practices and safe assisted monitoring of blood glucose are important not only to us, but to our guiding agencies. The next few bullet points highlight important information from each of these agencies, as this is of concern for the safety of residents and staff. 
The CDC launched their one and only campaign in 2012 in order to eliminate unsafe medical injections. In 2010, the CDC posted a clinical reminder stating, the use of finger stick devices on more than one person poses risk for transmitting bloodborne pathogens. In 2012, another CDC clinical reminder was posted, which carries the message that insulin pens must never be used for more than one person. The CDC also has a section under their injection safety website for infection prevention during blood glucose monitoring and insulin administration. CMS, the entity that has regulatory oversight for many nursing homes in Virginia, also has concerns with regard to infection prevention and control as it relates to safe injection practices and blood glucose monitoring, as devices and practices associated with these can lead to the transmission of bloodborne pathogens. These concerns include, but are not limited to, when a finger stick device is used on more than one resident, when a glucose meter is used on more than one resident without proper cleaning and disinfection between residents, when insulin pens are shared between residents, which is similar to reusing needles or syringes for more than one resident, and also with the use of the same needle, syringe, pen, or injection devices for more than one individual. In 2009, the FDA issued an alert reminding that single patient insulin pens and insulin cartridges should not be used to administer medication to multiple patients. In 2015, the FDA required label warnings to be placed on pen devices to prohibit sharing of multi-dose diabetes pen devices among patients. Insulin pens must be clearly labeled with the resident's name and other identifiers to verify that the correct pen is used on the correct resident. The Joint Commission, the agency that surveys hospitals, just in May of this year provided education on infection control risks related to glucose monitoring and insulin administration in their Joint Commission online website, and is concerned with ensuring that manufactured instructions for use are followed when performing assisted monitoring of blood glucose with regard to cleaning and disinfection, the disinfectant product, and the dwell time. If not, residents may be placed at risk for exposure to bloodborne pathogens. They want to know that a multi-person device is properly disinfected between uses and that the disinfectant is effective against bloodborne pathogens. Staff should understand infection prevention and control practices, procedures, and the associated risks if these are not followed. There should be documentation that staff are trained and staff should be able to speak to how to properly use injection devices and blood glucose monitoring equipment. Injection safety and safe practices when providing assistance with blood glucose monitoring are also important to the Virginia Department of Health, as you can see from the various documents, posters, and tools listed on this page that are available for reference and use. Links to these tools are provided in the slide deck. Please take time to look at these helpful tools. Training and education of staff who will be performing injections and assisting with blood glucose monitoring procedures is essential to help ensure everyone knows the risks and the proper procedures to follow to provide safe care. Recommendations for training and education include providing hepatitis B vaccination to previously unvaccinated at-risk staff, and to establish infection prevention and control oversight, to be able to provide infection prevention and control training to staff on standard precautions, PPE, safe injection practices, aseptic technique, and reporting infection control breaches. Ensure that staff demonstrate knowledge competency on safe injection practices before performing injections. To conduct training and assess competency at the time of hire, annually, and with changes to equipment and devices and to reinforce and monitor safe injection practices through routine audits by periodically observing staff who perform or assist with these procedures. Other training and education points to consider include the following. It's important to consider a diagnosis of acute viral hepatitis infection in patients or residents with illness that includes hepatic dysfunction or elevated liver transaminases and promptly report any suspected instances of newly acquired bloodborne infections such as hepatitis B in a facility resident or staff member to the public health authorities. And check with state authorities for specific state and federal regulations regarding laboratory testing of the source and exposed persons. 
Important take-home messages we would like to leave with you today include use one needle and one syringe only one time. Identify locations for designated clean medication preparation. Perform proper hand hygiene and use aseptic technique during all steps of medication preparation and administration. Finger stick devices should never be used for more than one person. Select single use devices that permanently retract upon puncture. Dedicated blood glucose meters to a single resident if possible. If feared, the device should be cleaned and disinfected after every use per manufacturer's instructions. Insulin pens and other medication cartridges and syringes are for single use only and should never be used for more than one person. Use available resources from the Virginia Department of Health and other guiding agencies to educate staff on safe injection practices and safe assistance with blood glucose monitoring. You may find these three tools helpful, the CDC's Injection Safety Observation of Centralized Medication for Medication Preparation, the CDC's Injection Safety Point of Care Testing, and the VDH Observation Tool for Monitoring Practices during Assisted Monitoring of Blood Glucose to help ensure safe practices. More resources can be found on the VDH HAI Antimicrobial Resistance website. Several resources have been included on this page for your reference with safe injection practices and assisted monitoring of blood glucose. References are here and here. And lastly, Thank you for your time. We hope this webinar on safe injection practices and assisted monitoring of blood glucose has been helpful. This concludes the recorded portion of the webinar. We will now join the meeting to allow time for discussion and questions. Thank you.